Happy New Year. While 2024 is going to be full of the insanity that you've all come to expect, I thought I would ease us into it by first discussing something nice, calm and relaxing. Fishing. What is not to love about fishing? You've got the great outdoors, beautiful nature, peace and quiet, a good book, the chance to relax by the water and smoke some salmon and the fish are a nice bonus as well. A wise man once said, it's like yoga, except you get to kill something. Or at least that's how fishing is supposed to be. You see, no matter how relaxing your hobby is, anything can be made competitive. And with competition comes clout, prizes and sponsors. And with clout, prizes and sponsors comes cheating. But Dankula, I hear you cry, cheating in other sports makes sense with doping scandals and whatnot, but how can you cheat at fishing? Well, it turns out there are actually a surprising number of ways that you can cheat at fishing, and we're about to get into all of them, because there was one man who pulled every single trick in the book to get to the top, reeling in money, fame and glory, but not fish, by any means necessary. Fishing's most notorious cheater, Mike Long. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get started, this video is brought to you by Omni Heroes. Omni Heroes is a heroic fantasy and strategy RPG for casual play, but provides enough of a challenge to keep you entertained. As an Omni Guardian, it will be up to you to rescue the captive Valkyries from demons and fight together against the evil threatening the world. You will summon forth 100 plus legendary heroes, unlock multiple synergies and match with hundreds of team compositions at will. Omni Heroes has received recommendations from both the Google Play Store and also the Apple App store with over 1 million downloads. Omni Guardians are called upon to rescue captive Valkyries from demons and fight with fellow players to rid the world of their evil threat. You will summon forth powerful legendary heroes, unlock synergies and match with hundreds of team competitive games at will. Omni Heroes is gearing up for an exciting Season 1 on January the 12th. Mark your calendars, get ready for an electrifying experience with a captivating new storyline, roguelike dungeon gameplay and GVG mode only through united efforts and seizing opportunities can you become the ultimate victors of Clash Domain, with two new tanks, Elmer and Sandra, and two warriors, Althea and Gloria. You will have plenty to do and unlock. So please click my link in the description box down below to download Omni Heroes now and claim 777 times 3 free pulls and be part of the exciting Season 1. If you haven't already downloaded the game, now is the perfect time to do so. Seize this opportunity to download the game and claim 777 times 3 summons, welcoming 5 legendary heroes into your roster within the first week. Show them some love. <coughs> click the link. I love fishing. I love fishing so much. I don't get to do it much nowadays, but I still love fishing. Fishing is supposed to be a relaxing sport, but when you introduce a competitive nature to it, things can get a little bit stressful. And with competition comes cheaters which there are a lot of in fishing. I mean, the last big fishing cheating scandal was just last year. We got weights in fish! There we go! Oh, the two men could face felony charges, fines, and possibly some prison time. Guys? Wow. Wow. There is nothing sacred anymore. I also personally was cheated out of first place when I took part in a juniors fishing event at Drumpelier Locks when I was about 14 years old. And months after the event, it came out that the guy who beat me for first place actually put stones inside his fish. And he thought it would be a good idea to just walk around and brag about it. Not thinking that eventually it would get back to me. The first place prize was actually a really nice fishing rod as well. 
So even though this was over 20 years ago, I'm, I'm still seething about it. But let's take a look at one of the most famous fishermen on the scene. The Tony Hawk of fishing, if you will. A man who was all over angling magazines, was breaking records left and right, and had fishing companies practically kicking down his door so they could sponsor him. What an illustrious sounding career. Shame it was all built on a lie. Allegedly. In the late 90s, Mike Long burst onto the scene of big bass fishing, and he took the hobby by storm. Taking the discipline very seriously, the secret to his success seemed to be an almost monk-like focus. Long was one of those types that worked alone and did not like his flow being interrupted, describing his process thusly. I'll tell my family and friends that I'm on a blood trail. It means I smell blood and I'm going in for the kill. Not literally, of course, but that I'm serious and focused and ready. That's not something I can do when I'm fishing for fun with a friend. So, Mike Long really prefers fishing alone. We'll come back to that later. Say what you will about how extra he was about sitting on his ass for hours until a fish decided to nibble on his line, but Long seemed like a real fish magnet. In his heyday in the early 2000s, he claimed to have caught hundreds of bass bigger than £10, 82 bass over £15, and a £20 12-ounce chonker named Dotty, a replica of which was on display during an appearance by Kellen Ellis, the protagonist of this story who we will introduce properly later on, on a podcast called Bass Talk Live. According to Bassmaster magazine, Dotty was the 10th heaviest bass of all time. Long was by no means a small fry in the fishing scene. He was quickly becoming the Tiger Woods of fishing. His hype had the entire bass community caught hook, line and sinker. Women wanted him, fish feared him. With all of Long's fishing success came a pretty bright spotlight. ESPN articles were written about him, and he was featured on the cover of Bassmaster magazine in 2001 and 2009, and he graced the front of over 40 other magazines. He also brought in tournament prize money left and right, totaling to around $150,000 after winning over 35 tournaments. Included in this figure is two consecutive $25,000 paydays for winning the Big Bass Record Club's largest largemouth competition in 1999 and in 2000. On the former occasion, Long actually took home $28,400 after also catching a bass that bagged him the prizes for 3rd and 10th place. So, the organisers actually changed the rules in the year 2000 so that each competitor could only take home one prize. Long's fishing prowess led to him becoming known as the Big Bass Guru. And his profile was raised to the point where he was making a big splash even outside of the tournaments that he was fishing in. His legend had seriously raised San Diego's profile in the bass fishing scene and attracted anglers from as far away as Japan. And Long became so influential that he was allowed to fish at lakes out of hours and for free in return for a bit of shilling for the lake to attract more paying anglers. But... We'll get back to that later. But it wasn't just Japanese hobbyists that were flocking to Long. Companies were as well, who paid to use Long's likeness for lines of fishing gear, no pun intended, including high-end rods and lures, and especially swim baits, which Long was a big proponent of. Swim baits are based on the principle that there is always a bigger fish, and they're made to look and move like the small fish that the bigger ones, like bass, feed on. And these things really caught on thanks to Long's endorsement of them. His influence on the bass world was so great that Kellen Ellis said, and I quote, The fishing industry, particularly the craze surrounding swim baits, wouldn't be the same today if it weren't for Mike Long. In 2001 and 2002, Long was ranked number one in fishing and hunting newsies top 40 anglers, and clinching the top spot twice in a row got him considered to be the best fisherman in California. 
Yeah, it's pretty clear his fish ain't no size two. He was all about that bass, no treble. Well, trebles can sometimes be good, it just depends on what you're fishing for. But anyway, in 2003, Long dropped to second place and fell to third the following year. Those are still pretty damn respectable ranks, but by 2009, Long had fallen all the way down to 17th place. As the 2000s came to an end, a strange shift occurred. Tournaments were starting to see their attendance decline as former entrants began to question the tournament's integrity. But while no allegations would be made publicly for quite some time, a lot of anglers were looking at Long and wondering if something fishy was going on. You see, they looked at the data, and Long's numbers looked a little bit cooked. You see, his win rate was more than 55% when competing solo, but only 25% when he was competing with a partner. As Ellis put it, and I quote, from the results still available on the internet, he fished 27 tournaments by himself, including a couple that he fished with his young son Colton. And he won 15 of those. And strangely, Long often fished alone in tournaments where he had entered with a partner listed. So he won a lot more when he fished alone. Some might say without any witnesses present. That discrepancy is a little bit odd. And the tournament organisers thought so as well. Because in the spring of 2010, Long was barred from participating in three tournaments without first taking a lie detector test. He didn't take the lie detector tests, so he didn't compete. Notably, he was also absent from that year's Fishing and Hunting Newsies Top 40 list. And before it was released, the author also published a piece titled Tips on Spotting the Bass Cheater. What did he mean by this? But it wasn't just tournament organisers and fishing journalists that were suspicious. Throughout the 2000s, Kellen Ellis was a big fan and a good friend of Mike Long, and was often among his most staunch defenders against all of the allegations of dodginess. Eventually, however, the allegations piled up so much that Ellis could no longer ignore the smell of blood in the water. For one, despite having known each other through fishing for a decade, they had never been out fishing together. I wonder why. The first serious sign of trouble came in 2010 when Long asked Ellis to produce some fishing videos for him. But he wouldn't let Ellis come to record him in action. Instead, Long suggested that, and I quote, I'll call you when I catch a big one, and we will recreate the catch. Despite this being what pretty much every single fishing TV show does, Ellis said no. And the doubts that he had always rejected and argued against before were now firmly cemented in his mind. And after they built up to the point where he could no longer ignore them, he broke off contact with Mike Long. And he started to investigate Long's career and achievements in February of 2010. The main driver of this mission was that Ellis wanted to restore faith in tournaments and make a £10 bass mean something again. After all, catching huge bass is quite a feat, and Long is just out there bagging them daily like they're nothing. Something has got to be going on there. And after Ellis spent almost a decade digging and contacting informants, it turned out that there was something going on. It turned out that the only thing that Long actually cast was a dark shadow on competitive fishing. Ellis told all in a massive nine-page expose titled The Dark Secret of America's Big Bass Guru which he published on his website, SD Fish. The article would have been an amazing source to use for this video, and I would have encouraged all of you to read it for yourselves, but sadly, the website is down, all of the links to it that I could find are dead, and the Wayback Machine only archived four pages. So, that fucking sucks. So, what did Ellis find? Well, for one, Long made all of his biggest catches while he was alone. 
Now, that doesn't necessarily mean anything by itself, after all, lots of fishermen are lonely, but it does mean that there were no witnesses to verify that Long really did catch those fish, and if he did, that he caught them honestly. And as Ellis' investigation progressed, it became increasingly clear that Long had taken this hat to heart a little bit too much. From 2018, Ellis spent two seasons staking out Long's regular fishing spots, decked out in camo with a camera equipped with a long zoom lens. It was a long and expensive endeavour, but it was important for Ellis to get some hard evidence to back up the circumstantial and testimonial evidence that he had gathered so far. As he put it himself, after all these years, I wanted proof of his despicable tactics that even his most loyal supporters wouldn't be able to refute. Proof that explained once and for all how Mike Long was able to get his hands on all of these massive largemouth bass. After the truth came to light, the attitudes of women and fish towards Mike Long became too varied and complex to be accurately described in an article. So, here's a video that just catches him in the act. Now, people that don't fish won't really know what's going on, but people that do fish pay close attention to the way that Long's rod is moving in this clip and see if you can figure out what he's doing. What's going on there is called snagging, which is a scummy method used by those who, never mind women, can't even attract a fish. Normal fishing involves using baits or lures to entice the fish into swallowing the hook. Whereas snagging just involves moving a line covered in treble hooks through the water, hoping to randomly hook a fish somewhere on its body, usually in its face or its gills or its back or somewhere else equally damaging, and then catching it that way. For all you zoomers out there who have never been outside, snagging is to real fishing what tool assists, glitches and estrogen are to speedrunning. Now, snagging happens, right? Snagging is something that will accidentally happen to you if you fish enough, right? It's happened to me before a bunch of times because I like to use lures a lot and sometimes you can just accidentally hook a fish somewhere on the body because it swam in the path of your lure. And it's not the best because it very often badly injures the fish. But if you look at the way that Mike Long is reeling and the sharp pulls of his rod through the reeds, he is clearly trying to snag a fish on purpose. And you can even see it in this clip because the hook isn't even in the fish's mouth, it's in its face. And if that clip isn't proof enough that Mike Long was snagging, well, here's another. Notice how the fish is coming out of the water sideways because the hook was embedded in its side, whereas fish that are caught properly come out of the water head first because they're suspended from a hook that they swallowed. And as long has the bass in the net in this picture here, you can see the hook in its side. It's clearly been snagged. And this isn't Ellis splitting hairs over an alternative fishing method that's contrary to the spirit of the sport by actively snatching fish out of the water instead of waiting for the fish to essentially trap itself. Long snagging is a big deal because it's actually illegal. I don't mean illegal in competitions, it's of course banned in competitions, I mean it's criminally illegal. Snagging is a crime on at least some level in almost every US state and here in Britain, because it really hurts the fish. Snagged fish escape very often because they're usually hooked through soft flesh and they can just fight and rip themselves off the hook, but that of course leaves a big gaping wound that can kill them or make them an easy target for predators. Another reason is snagging is much easier than proper fishing methods because it requires no skill, which can lead to overfishing. Snagging is a massive dick move against the fish, but it's also just not very sporting. 
but neither is Long, who had the gall to then measure and take pictures of the fish that he just snagged to post on his Instagram as if he was showing off a proper catch. Look at him, look at that smug bastard posing as if he's fucking hot shit. But Ellis and the hosts of Bass Talk Live pointed out the worst part of the social media posturing is the sheer disrespect. Shit happens to the best of us and fish sometimes can get snagged by genuine accident. But when that happens, you just immediately release the fish because as far as fishermen at large are concerned, if you snagged it, it doesn't count. But why was Long snagging bass? It hardly makes for good practice in a competition because he would have had to catch them properly on the day. Or did he? A former partner of Long's named John Kerr got into a bit of hot water with Long when his 13-year-old son Jordan spotted a large fish tank full of big bass in Long's garage. Why do you have a big fish tank full of very well-fed large bass in your garage, Long? Hmm? Well, well, what are those for, big guy? But being a child and not understanding the rule about snitches, Jordan didn't exactly keep his mouth shut about it. So Long, allegedly, right, allegedly, went to his fucking house and threatened him and his father asking where Jordan's bedroom was and shining a torch into the windows at night. Now, I don't need to tell you that that's a little bit fucked, but what's interesting about it is why Long would get so defensive about a tank of bass that he would literally stalk and threaten a fucking child. Well, the bass that Jordan saw later showed up in Long's boat at a competition. Long was hiding fish from other lakes in a tank in his garage, feeding them and fattening them up to a nice huge size that would be very difficult for them to achieve out in the wild, and then sneaking them into tournaments. He blew petered his fucking catches. Long really went to the trouble of illegally snagging fish, often doing so out of hours, which adds poaching to his list of crimes, hiding them in his house, and then sneaking them out to competitions, saying, here's one I prepared earlier, and then pocketing the prize money. And Long wasn't exactly subtle about it either. One tournament partner even turned around and pretended not to notice Long sticking his hook in a bass, and soon afterwards, a dead fish entered the boat. But why pretend not to notice, I hear you ask? Well, as you can probably guess from his behaviour with Jordan Kerr, Long was very quick to throw threats at his detractors, and possibly could have tried to carry them out. After a long day of fishing with a friend in the same area as Long, Kerr felt a wobbling as he drove home, and he found out that the lug nuts on his vehicle had been loosened. Other partners and lake staff who had called out Long on his bullshit also allegedly had their vehicles messed with. Imagine potentially killing someone because they tried to expose your darkest secret of being a shit fisherman. By the way, when I say that Long really wasn't subtle about Blue Peter and his bass, I really do mean it. He once called a friend to brag about catching a 13-pounder. Guess the weight of the fish that won him a solo tournament the very next day. How about that? And remember when I said that he'd be invited to fish at certain lakes out of hours? Well, even when he wasn't invited, he would very often illegally fish at reservoirs and lakes anyway, usually at night. And this was noticed. The size, shape and colour of the bass that he caught in lakes at certain competitions was often a bit off according to a number of sources that Ellis spoke to. One of these sources was the assistant reservoir keeper at Lake Sutherland, Diane Dine, who told Ellis about a time that Long pulled out a record-breaking fish that didn't belong in that lake on the 11th of March 2000. And what do you know, he just so happened to be fishing at a different lake that morning. 
Just for those who don't know, the same species of fish can have subtle differences to size, shape, coloration, patterns, etc., depending on what lake or body of water they are from. They are the same species, but they've been separated for so long that subtle differences end up occurring. Essentially, evolution in action. Like, a brown trout from Loch Rannoch might have a greater density of spots than a brown trout from Loch Trieg. They are both still brown trouts, but they have subtle differences where you can kind of tell that they are not from the same body of water because there is too much genetic difference. And anyone that knows one particular body of water for a long time can spot these differences. Diane Dine also said, and I quote, That was the first time I had ever seen him up there. I have regulars that are there every week fishing for bass, and this guy comes up, spends, what, 30 minutes out on the lake, and has a lake record. What? The way he did it, it was just, it was so wrong. Of course, at the time there was no way of proving it, but considering what has since came out about Mike Long, the story really seems to check out. And Long seemed to have a bit of a habit of just showing up to lakes and claiming records that guys who had been fishing that same lake for decades had never even come close to. For example, Long's 2002 record at Lake Poway. He did provide photographic evidence for it, except the photo was of a fish that someone else caught. Long also claimed that it was two pounds heavier than it actually was. Now, to be fair, Long did admit to it on a Facebook post in May of 2014, saying, and I quote, For the record, many years ago I caught an 18 at Lake Poway and my 35mm film did not capture the bass, and Bill Rice, who was the editor at Western Outdoors, wanted a picture and I sent him one of me holding my friend's bass. And yes, that was wrong. Yeah, bro, I totally caught that big bass, but the photos just didn't come out, so you're just going to have to trust me, bro. Oh, you should have should have seen it was this big. Oh, it was massive and it was on my line. You've just got, you just got to trust me, bro. Fuck you. Fuck you, you little arsehole. You can't just pass that off as a little bit of a whoopsie. Well, maybe you can, because at the time, Long actually had a lot of forum posters defending him, saying things like, a dumb mistake by a younger Mike Long. But it doesn't take away from his overall fishing credibility for me. If anything, it shows he's man enough to admit to it and take responsibility for his actions. Another comment read, Agreed, still a monster bass catching legend. But it gets even better. Sure, you could write the incident off as a mistake by a well-meaning emerging champion wanting to play to the press, if Long hadn't used the exact same picture again to claim a lake record three years later. Like, he didn't even catch a new bass and take a new picture. He just reused the exact same picture he had already used before. And somehow, no one spotted this until years later. Analysis of another picture also revealed that the fish it depicted was not caught where Long said it was caught. Many such cases. So, the accounts and evidence of Mike Long cheating explain the discrepancy in his success rate in solo and partnered events. He cheated in the former, and his partners did all of the work in the latter. Especially John Kerr, with whom Long won six consecutive titles. According to Kerr, Long only accounted for one of the 35 bass that the pair caught in their first season together. Kerr also claimed that it took three years for Mike Long to learn how to use a bait caster. I'm about to start a little bit of drama within the fishing community. Look, if you like bait casters and they work for you, that's great, fantastic. You have fun and enjoy your fishing. I think they're fucking terrible and they're shit. <laughs> I, just, I just don't see what they offer that our regular rod can't give you. See it seriously. I mean, if you like them, you, you go nuts, that's fine. But I mean, 
I've learned to use one, and I thought, oh, I know, I know, I have to like relearn the fucking sport again. But maybe there really is a good draw to these rods. Maybe there's a reason why they're so annoying to fucking use, and you have to relearn how to cast and all that stuff. But maybe, maybe they have something. They don't. They don't. It's just, it's just. Hey, do you want fishing to be more complicated? It's shit. I learned how to use one, and I was so disappointed because I put the time and into casting the fucking thing over and over and over for hours to learn how to fucking use it, and the they offer nothing. <laughs> like they offer absolutely nothing. But again, if you if you enjoy it, you have fun. I just think they're shit. Argue about it in the comments. I don't read those. And that's the real crux of the issue. It wasn't even just a case of a seasoned competitor turning down a dark path to gain an edge like we see so often in the sporting world. Mike Long's entire persona was a complete fucking lie. He couldn't even just win on his own merit. He couldn't even fucking fish. He was completely fucking useless. As Ellis scathingly put it, perhaps the hardest thing for people to believe about Long was that he's not even a good fisherman to start with. In addition to witnessing him cheating, his former partners shared the same sentiment of Long. That he was a surprisingly poor bass fisherman. The biggest shock of this entire scandal was that no one was really surprised. <laughs> there was so much testimony from so many people that it seemed like it was pretty much just a big open secret and Ellis just decided to say the quiet part out loud. But let me tell you, Ellis really rocked the boat when he did so. Within two days of their publication, the article and snagging video garnered almost 75,000 and 125,000 views across the website and YouTube, respectively. Long was subsequently memed on very heavily as he was cancelled in record time. However, not all of the memes were created equally, but please remember, a lot of anglers are boomers, but God bless them, they're trying. The fishing community and the fish entered an uneasy alliance against Long. Aeris Rods, one of his sponsors, stopped selling their line of Long's rods and donated their leftover stock to a kid's angling school. And, as an extra fuck you, they posted this announcement with a picture of one of these signature rods pierced by a treble hook. Aeris Rods COO also said, and I quote, We sell bass fishing rods worldwide, and we sponsored Mike Long because he was famous all over the world, the US, Europe, Japan. Up until last week, Mike Long was probably considered the best big bass fisherman in the world. But really, Long was just the fishing world's Lance Armstrong. Except, even Armstrong didn't have the balls to be so brazen about it. As the dust settled on Long's cancellation, the entire fishing community waited with bated breath to see how he would respond. And he just didn't. He didn't respond to any request for a comment, and he just deleted his social media. He also took down his blog ostensibly for maintenance. I know that pleading the fifth is in no means an indicator of guilt, but that's not a good look. I understand not wanting to deal with it publicly, but why scrub the social media unless you don't want people digging too deeply into your activity? To me, that feels a little bit like frantically deleting the pension files when the cops come knocking. But on that note, I do have to say that all of these accounts are just allegations. There have been no testimonies or witnesses for the defence, and nothing has been hashed out in a court of law. So, while Ellis and the fishing community at large have painted an extremely compelling picture of Long's chicanery, in the interest of fairness, just bear in mind that the story will have another side. He'd probably end up floundering if he ever does try to defend himself, but hey, Long deserves his due process just as much as anyone else, and it would be wrong to leave him up the creek without a paddle. Despite being the most chilled out hobby of all time, there is somehow drama in the fishing community, complete with misappropriated funds, spoiled competitions, and destroyed relationships. You'd think that fishing would be an ideal way to escape from all of that bullshit which plagues so much of the online space, but it's kind of hard to touch grass in the middle of a lake. As Ellis summed up the whole affair, and I quote, 
The guy literally faked lake records and set the bar higher than the lakes were capable of producing. He took all of the lake records in San Diego and made them meaningless because the lake officials and the anglers don't know what to make of them. And he took records from people who deserved to own them. And not only were those records stolen, but Long had completely fucked the standards. After all, when so many massive bass hit the deck, the bar gets artificially raised for everyone else, and other anglers just can't compete. As Ellis said, and I quote, A 12 pound bass caught by some weekend warrior on one of the local lakes didn't mean anything to anyone other than the guy who caught it. And that's not right. A 12 pounder should mean something, but when Mike Long says he's caught a dozen 12 plus pounders in the last month, how do we celebrate this guy's legitimate fish? So yeah, Mike Long built his entire career on a lie and became such an intrinsically huge part of the fishing scene that he kind of ruined everything for everyone. But it's not all bad. Fishermen find solace in the sea. Our only friend, the worm upon our hook. Wriggling, writhing, struggling to surmount the mortal pointlessness that permeates this barren world. We are alone, we are empty, and yet we fish. I need to get one of the hats. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody subscribe! <laughs>